Good to see everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning practice group. <clears throat> uh, my name is Wynne Fricke and um, I'm a long time person at Common Ground. I teach and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Common Ground and um, yeah, I'm happy to be here this morning uh, to step in for Mark while he's uh, taking a personal retreat at Prairie Farm. And then he'll be back next week. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll take the first half an hour to do a little guided meditation, a chance to settle into our bodies. So let's take a moment to take our seat. <clears throat> So we feel our body in an upright position. And in that uprightness of our posture, we're reflecting the uprightness in the mind. Being right in the middle of our experience. And we can check in with the body and just notice if there's any tensions that can be easily released. Good places to look are around the face and shoulders. The whole area of the belly and the rib cage. And there's a sense of allowing the breath to move freely. And there's a sense of allowing the mind to rest in the body. Let the attention rest in the body. The attention settles just like our body settles. And it lands on the feelings of warmth and coolness and pressure. Expansion, contraction. hardness and softness.
And we can let the attention land specifically on the movement of the breath. So it's the mind knowing the inhalation, the mind knowing the exhalation, and keeping it simple. The sensations of breathing in, the sensations of breathing out. We use the breath to gather the mind. And we can begin to get detailed in our attention. What is the length of each inhale? What is the length of each exhale? How does the pressure waver? Is it cool or is it warm? What does the mind do with the pause at the top? the pause at the bottom. So training the mind to connect and to sustain attention on the breath.
And let's move our attention now to the whole body more broadly. And the breath can stay present as part of the background. But we're expanding the field of attention to the whole body. And this is the kind of attention it doesn't need to grasp or reach out. It receives sensation. So seeing what comes to the attention. And as part of our awareness of the body, we can include an awareness of space, the perception of space. And we can infer a sense of space by movement, by the sensations and the space between them. So including an interest in this perception of space
And please take a moment to stretch, do what you need to do to be comfortable. <clears throat> Okay, well, once again, welcome from wherever you're coming from, wherever you're seated. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give a talk for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Um, if it makes sense, maybe we could have a little Q&A or, or comment moment if you have something you want to share about your practice. And then at 11.45, um, there's an optional breakout group time. Nancy Buller, I know, is here and she can um, set us up so that you have a little time if you'd like to connect with uh, some community members about your practice and about whatever came up for you in relationship to the talk. Um, so I thought today, <clears throat> uh, I thought I would talk about generosity, understanding that generosity is foundational to the path and also sort of appreciating that, you know, I haven't had that much interest in it, you know, given that it's foundational to the path. So sometimes I use this opportunity when I'm talking to the group, like, okay, where are the holes in my understanding? You know, what needs attention? And this is one of those places that I feel, let's give some attention to generosity, you know, over the years. And it's been a lot of years, you know, when there's, uh, after a program, and there's a little talk about, you know, Donna is the poly word for translation, that someone in the community will offer a little talk about this deep tr tradition that's as old as the Buddha, um, which means, you know, common ground and other spiritual institutions, the Dhamma is to sustain through giving and without any expectation of return. And, and uh, you know, Mark has asked me, you know, many times, why don't, why don't you give the Dharma talk tonight? And it's like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to give the Dharma talk. And, uh, and so just, just wanted to look at what that is, you know, and, and um, yeah, sort of appreciating what does it mean that generosity is foundational to this path? There's this image of a three pronged stool, three legs of a stool, um, that support the Dhamma. And one is mind training, bhavana. Uh, one is ethical living, sila. And then one is generosity, dana. And that all these three aspects need to be in balance. Um, yeah. Um, and, and when they're in balance, we ourselves can be upright and stable in the way a stool can be upright and stable. And yeah, it occurred to me like how powerful it would be to do a 10 day retreat, you know, focused on generosity. <laughs> you know, I've been so interested in mind training, you know, I've been kind of galvanized around that subject, but what would it mean for me to take 10 days to contemplate generosity, how my life can be an act of generosity? And what does that mean? What does that look like? So the Buddha, described <clears throat> generosity as the antidote to greed. Um, and that uh, when we give, it weakens the force of craving, of grasping in the mind. There's a um, statue at Common Ground of, um, let me say her name, Mahapajapati Gautami. This was the, this was the stepmother of the Buddha who raised raise the Buddha and she she has an open palm she stands upright and has an open palm and I really like this image of of the hand of the open hand uh, as a way of being in the world you know and and the connection the energetic connection of the heart expressed through the arms and through the hands sort of circle of, of giving and receiving that characterizes uh, generosity so I just wanna talk about two technical things. There's two, two related words, chaga and dana. And um, we sometimes wrap them both in the word dana, 
which you know means generosity, it means gift or giving. Uh, but chaga has a, a specific meaning, which is the quality of the heart or the mind that wants to give. So it's the internal dimension, the intentional dimension, and dana is the act of giving. Um, the, uh, the root of dana, da, um, first appeared in, uh, you know, in Hinduism and the Vedic scriptures, and um, it means the act of giving to those in distress. So I just appreciated that, that little piece of, of history. So dana emphasizing the action and chaga emphasizing the intention or feeling of wanting to give. So, um, as I said, you know, this, this was born uh, 2,500 years ago at the time of the Buddha, where he, he instituted, uh, you know, um, generosity as part of the monastic culture. Uh, and it's the, the monks and the nuns and their relationship to um, the lay people. So, you know, you might know or not, but, you know, when you choose to live as a monk or nun, you have, you choose to have only four belongings, you know, you can have something that, a shelter, you can have medicine, you can have your ropes, and you can have your bowl, and your bowl is for collecting alms. So you're, you're not even allowed to store food, you can, and you're not allowed to ask for food, you know, so you, you go through the village and the, the villagers will, you know, give a scoop uh, of food into your bowl and you accept what is, whatever is given. And the idea of this is to reflect the interdependence of the monastic community and the lay community. They stand on each other and with each other. Um, and I think it's a, a reflection of the greater inter interdependence, which is just you know, one of the characteristics we all know and live with in being a human being. <clears throat> I, um, <clears throat> I spent almost two and a half months in uh, Burma in this monastery called Chanmayeta. It was in Mobi, a, a rural part of Burma. And I really experienced something I, I didn't know was missing until I was practicing there. And, and just, from, just from the first moment, um, uh, there was just the feeling of, of the history and faith and generosity that just was in the fabric. It was in the air of the place. And, uh, and it was so supportive. My, my practice was so buoy, buoyed up by, by this flavor, which was new, you know, it was new. And it's not only, you know, when you, when you go to a place like this, you can stay indefinitely. You have shelter and they feed you. You're not expected to pay anything. Um, the only expectation is that you, you do your practice. Um, and <clears throat> for the, for the uh, lay people and for the nuns who ate in the dining hall and for the, nun, and for the monks who, for whatever reason, couldn't go on alms rounds, um, for the meals, the, um, the families you know, of the local villagers would donate, uh, or a group of families would donate all the meals for a day at the monastery. And, and um, so for each day when a meal was donated that way, the whole family or the extended family would come to the dining hall and they'd sit around the periphery um, or in a, in a corner. And, um, and there was such a sense of joy in this relationship um, of, of the monastics sort of offering spiritual guidance, practicing for the lay people who are busy surviving and making the world happen. So it's like this mutual respect and understanding. And, um, but it was so honoring for me to uh, kind of feel um, the love and care that, that these families had. And on, on one meal, there was a very old woman who, who she just sat just to the side of me and for the, the entirety of the meal she was kneeling and she just fanned me you know and it was hot it was hot and she for the whole length of the meal she fanned me and um and these are slow meals this is the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition where you know everything you do 
is glacially slow and, and, you know, mindful. And it was a tremendous practice for me to receive this offering, you know, like to really feel it and to, to be inspired by it and to let my practice be inspired by it. So there's a few paragraphs I want to read from this book by Lewis Hyde. It's called The Gift, Creativity and the Artist in the Modern World. And he, he researches how gifts function in communities. And, you know, and he, he's an artist and sort of uh, sees art making as part of this um, culture of, of gifts that that don't exactly have a commercial value, that they sort of have a gift that, that is beyond that. And he says, <clears throat> uh, the primary work on gift exchange, and when he says work, he means research. The primary work on gift exchange has been done in anthropology, not, it seems to me, because gifts are a priv primitive or aboriginal form of property. They aren't but because gift exchange tends to be an economy of small groups, of extended families, small villages, close-knit communities, and of course, tribes. Unlike the sale of a commodity, the giving of a gift tends to establish a relationship between the two parties involved. Furthermore, when gifts circulate within a group, their commerce leaves a series of interconnected relationships in its wake and a kind of decentralized cohesiveness emerges. Yeah, and I, I, I really like this decentralized cohesiveness. I feel like that describes common ground too, you know, which kind of grew up for me mysteriously, you know, you know just out of the gift giving of, you know, countless people. And this, these are the words of the Buddha. He says, <clears throat> and how is a person of integrity, a person of integrity in the way he or she gives a gift? There is the case where a person of integrity gives a gift attentively with their own hand, respectfully, not as if throwing it away, and with the view that something will come of it. This is how a person of integrity is a person of integrity in the way he or she gives a gift. I've also uh, done a number of Zen retreats, maybe some of you have too, and in a Zen sashin, the eating is very ritualized also, and there's an oryoki bowl. Um, oryoki translate as, as just enough, but one of the rituals as part of eating is that you, you offer a morsel of rice or tofu and you, you put it aside, and, and that's intended to um, be an offering for all the, uh, they're called hungry ghosts, sort of these formless beings that live in a lot of craving. And, um, but, but for me, you know, besides that, it, it feels like it's a way of remembering this interconnection, um, this offering, this giving and taking is, is natural. Yeah, how generosity puts the spiritual practitioner in relationship to the world. <clears throat> so I really experienced this just enough attitude um, while I was in Burma, you know, and, uh, you know, just feeling, you know, you just have your, your small kuti, this is a little structure that, that you live in and, um, I had two outfits, the same outfits, a brown skirt and a white shirt and a sash and wore the same thing every day. And, um, you know, and I ate what was given and, and, uh, and, and the simplicity of it was, uh, it was a lesson to me at how, uh, how calming it was and how it really let my mind gather around what it needed to do in terms of the practice. So, like I, I, I consider how, you know, what my mind has to do every time I face my closet in the morning, like making my choices to, you know, figure out what to wear, you know, whatever. And just, just the sort of complication of, 
of all of that, but you know, sort of, I, I hold that a little bit as an aspiration, this living in a way, just enough, having just enough. I, I sometimes reflect on just the force of consumerism in our, in our culture. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a Vietnamese, um, just a wonderful monk. Um, and he, he elaborates a little bit on the fifth precept. And the fifth precept is taking up the training to refrain from intoxicants. And he adds to that, I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. Um, yeah, and, and I, I feel like that's, that same thing can be said to not cover up loneliness, anxiety, or, or suffering by collecting things around us with the idea that they will make us feel better. Um, This is from Paul Hawken, who wrote the book Hooked, and he's an environmentalist and author dedicating uh, his life to sustainability and the changing relationship between business and the environment. And he says this, the dominant culture of a modernizing invasive industrialism stimulates yet can never satisfy the urge for a strong sense of self to overlay the angst and the sense of lack in the human condition. As a result, goods, services, and experiences are consumed beyond any reasonable need. Alleviating people's sense of isolation and fear can do more than any recycling program. We can reduce our desires by being generous and kind. It's hard to be grasping when we are reaching out. So the way I, I try to hold this is that I, I try not to have more than I can be mindful of. Like I've, I've done a slow weeding of all the kind of deep recesses of the basement. Like I, don't, I wanna know where everything is, nothing, nothing hidden. You know, I don't wanna have anything that I'm not, I, I don't have the energy or time to be mindful of. And then in, in that's the case, find ways to give it away. <clears throat> so the Buddha said that uh, there are three ways to give wisely. Um, the first is to give with an understanding of karma. And that simply means that whatever we set in motion will bear fruit, our actions bear fruit. Whatever we give will bear fruit. Um, and the second, give with the understanding that the receiver, the giver, the giving, and the gift are all impermanent, and they are all dependently arisen. So, um, you know, in other words, in the whole act of generosity, there is nothing inherently existent in any one piece. Everything is in motion. The giving, the giver the receiver. I, I think it's a, it's a useful to have a felt sense of this fragility, this impermanence, this sense of, you know, that we are verbs <laughs> in a way participating. And, and like, it, it makes sense how clinging is like going against nature, you know, it's, it's like a delusion to, to feel that we can hold and cling and to call something as mine um, is, is part of that, that ignorance of going upstream that doesn't align with how it is. And so the, the third one is to give with the intention to strengthen one's effort to become enlightened give with the intention to strengthen one's effort to become free. I, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> and I appreciate how these things um, need to be a conscious practice, at least for me. Like I, I was remembering uh, while I was in Burma, I offered, 
on my birthday, uh, I offered the meal to the whole community. And uh, this was just felt like such a great idea to me <laughs> when I did what a great way to celebrate my birthdays to offer a meal and it was it was beautiful you know I was invited into the office with one of the monks who could speak English and kind of talked about what the menu should be and, and all this stuff and it just planted a beautiful seed and I thought every year I'm going to give something big on my birthday, you know, I, I set that seed in motion and, and that never ever happened, you know, since that time, like that just never happened. And so, and, and as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's like, there's this idea of generosity that, yeah, I give and, uh, uh, but there has been an unwillingness to, like when I read these three ways of giving wisely, they feel very profound and they feel in need of attention, you know, behind the giving and behind the way we think about being in the world and engaging in the world. Um, so I think sometimes even just like I, I notice in my heart a lot, a lot feels burdensome in my life, getting up in the morning, you know, a lot about the work day, a lot about being on the computer, you know, and it's like, if I can get up in the morning and just reframe slightly, you know, how can these actions be a movement of generosity instead of a sort of knee jerk feeling of burdensome, you know, I, that's just like a little background thing for me. And so how can I, how can I play? How can I be creative and just shift the lens slightly? How can this be how can this be generous? And, and just even simple things like, like, how am I when I'm standing in line in the grocery store? You know, if I'm being impatient, like, how does that affect people? You know, what are, what's, a, what's a way to stand in line at the grocery store and be deeply generous to everything around me and to myself? Like, what does that look like? And I think it requires I think it requires intention because I think we're so busy, you know, just maybe not now, maybe not in the time of COVID, but you know, the, the demands of our work and just the agitation and our culture, you know, um, I, I feel like often we're just getting by. And so to sort of frame these intentions can be very enlivening, you know, and it should feel enlivening. I think that's the, that's the, um, that's what will tell us <laughs> if we're if we're kind of doing it in the right way, you know, because it feels good to give. So I've kind of I've kind of set a, a goal for myself, like every day I'm gonna give in three ways. You know, I'm gonna give something material, you know, just just every day, give something, win. Why not? You know, uh, and I'm gonna give an action. And I'm going to give something that somehow connects to love, you know, that connects to my heart, like finding a joy and letting something flow from there. So like those three, those three things. Um, and I'm going to give them with the intention to strengthen my effort toward freedom. That feels so important. And that feels energizing. So mindfulness is an aspect of generosity. So our generosity is imbued with wise attention. And generosity may not come naturally, you know, just like kindness may not come naturally. There, there's, you know, <laughs> we all come into the world a little different with different challenges and, um, and it's, it's just, uh, it's just something to know and to observe the places where gener ger generosity may flow easily and the places where, no, that's, that's really difficult in this arena. Um, Shayla Catherine uh, said, if we want to live with generosity and love, we can't neglect self-examination. Yeah, and I, I, and I think this is so important, you know, when we come up against, you know, when 
we have the intention, for instance, to be generous, and we come up against all the ways we're not generous, you know, and we come up against, you know, you know, our spitefulness or our our self-absorption or our greed and craving and you know all these parts of ourselves that maybe we prefer not to have. And I think it's such an important understanding to um, to move into this mindfulness with such a whole heart, like a kind of generosity that accepts and can hold, you know, what we find, you know, and, 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 you know, because I think we can just identify with the forces of greed and think I am a greedy person and, and how debilitating that is, you know, how debilitating. Sharon Salzberg was um, on Krista Tippett's On Being a few weeks ago, and she said something powerful for me. She said, shame is not a corrective path. Shame is not a corrective path. And she said, your awareness is bigger than the visitor. So these visitors of like, of, of, greed and of spitefulness or vengefulness or anger or irritation, aversion, you know, like not wanting to see, whatever it may be. These are visitors to the mind. And awareness is more powerful than visitors to the mind. And so this is what needs to be understood, where we abide in this very accepting, spacious understanding that these forces are impersonal that move through us. And we can be happy that we're seeing them. You know, that could, that's a wholesome, wholesome place to take interest. You know, there's this truth that, you know, if we're, when we're mindful uh, of an unskill, we'll call it unskillful mind state of defilement, you know, it's hard to use that word, but when, when we're mindful, when we're accepting and taking interest in, like that's a moment of purification, that's a moment of, of deepening seeing and insight, and that's as powerful as like a pure moment of offering where the heart is pure. So to see that there's no we don't need to have a preference or to feel bad, you know, when, when we're caught in a sort of downward spiral of fury, <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, what's, what's the move now? Yeah, so maybe maybe that's the first the first action of of generosity, you know, sort of this this showing up for ourselves in a gracious way that accepts whatever we see moving through us. In a recent short Q and A with uh, Venerable Analeo, he's a German monk and scholar based at the Berry Sun- Center for Buddhist Study. He just said something as part of another question, but it really stuck in my mind as a beautiful metaphor. He said, you know, we're all trees growing upward. We just all grow in our own way. You know, we each, we each have our own journey to make. And, and that was, it was just, just sort of beautiful. Like, you know, we're each our own seed. We come into this world with certain tendencies, you know, our roots might have to grow around a rock here, your might, roots might have to do this, but we're all growing upward. You know, we're all headed in the same direction. And just to appreciate that we're our own teachers in this way, you know, we come to know, you know, who we are, you know, who, who is this, what is this mind? <laughs> what are the tendencies of this mind and heart? <clears throat> I feel like my first, my very first Dhamma teacher was, um, was the choreographer Alwyn Nikolai, who I, I studied with in New York for a while. And, uh, 
and this was before I knew anything about Buddhism, and he certainly was not a, a Buddhist. <laughs> he was just teaching about dance and choreography, but I was powerfully impacted by what I learned and what he had to offer. And, and he would talk about, um, he would talk a lot about concentration and absorption and the responsibility of the dancer to, uh, to sort of um, absorb moment to moment into the intention of the movement, into the intention of the choreographer, you know, and he called it graining. You'd grain bodily, you'd grain energetically, you'd even sometimes grain physically like your eyes, you, you grain the whole intention toward what was being asked for in the choreography. And, uh, and this to me was just a very powerful um, sort of lesson in, in absorption and non-wavering. And, and, and he, he would talk about the guile of the dancer, the guile of the ego, which kind of wants to assert its own agenda that may be contrary to what's being asked for in the choreography. And so I looked up guile, you know, it's this like sly intelligence, but sort of the the grasping, the movement of the ego that has its own um, its own need, and 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 I saw this so clearly in myself in the form of, um, of like self consciousness and fear. Um, you know, when I was performing, there was such a fracture in the in the mind, was so dispersed of sort of the just the uncertainty, the self doubt. You know, very complicated. What what would come to my mind um, as I was, you know, trying to be in the space of loving and being generous because, you know, that's why I, I kind of moved into dance. It was, it was out of this need to express the heart, but, you know, I was coming up against myself in it. And it, it really propelled me to the cushion just to begin to look at, at these forces that were at work. Maybe I'll just say a little bit more. Um, I, I feel like this, again, this, this leg of generosity on the, the stool of the Dhamma. Um, uh, I feel like it, it's an invitation um, on many levels, but of, of taking action in the world also. Like it feels to me there's a, a beautiful balance in this way. I think the I think it's a false dichotomy of either we're an engaged Buddhist or we're, you know, a Buddhist that goes off to retreat. So that, that's not a, a correct understanding for me. But, but the specific act of generosity is by nature relational, right? It's relational and it's, a, it's an understanding, comes from an understanding that we're all part of the same fabric. You know, I love the image that Ruth King offers that, you know, that we are a constellation, you know, we might think we're just a star, but that that's actually not the case, that we are part of a network of innumerable, unknowable causes and conditions. And this force of generosity puts us again and again and again in relationship to community. <clears throat> And I also like this, this da, this root of dana, the act of giving to those in distress. So sort of having an eye for what's needed, you know, what's needed. And also um, in and appreciating the four foundations of mindfulness, you know, the four major areas that we attend to, you know, the, the, the foundation of the body as a place that we watch, the feeling quality, um, the mind and the dhammas, you know, these four categories of attention, but they all have an internal and an external um, piece of them. So internally, we we are aware of those things in ourselves, but externally, we are aware of those things in others. And this isn't emphasized very much. Um, and I think there's some debate about what this internally, externally refers to. 
but but the majority of the consensus that you know mostly i hear that this is this is this relational aspect we we understand you know not only this body but we can look and see the bodies around us we can have a sense of how they might feel of what their minds might be moving through or what what hindrances are they suffering you know so this this act of listening this being attentive um, that extends beyond our immediate body and into the outer world. So I, I feel like that's just an important um, to know that this is in in uh, in the foundations of mindfulness. This piece, this this piece of um, relational work. <clears throat> Yeah, and just the whole spectrum, you know, how, you know, our, our activism and the wider social culture and the, our activism on the cushion, you know, um, and to, to keep that very alive, that all are needed, you know, um, and it's not one or another. <laughs> uh, it's not one or another. And I feel like generosity is a way, you know, it's a way to um, come to balance in all aspects of the path. I was very uh, moved <clears throat> um, by the whole outpouring uh, that happened um, in this community after the killing of George Floyd over the summer uh, and uh, in this community and, and the world, you know, just just this outpouring and for me this um, reflection of our interdependent nature, you know, and watching this, this video of this African American man, you know, suffocating, being, being killed, how unbearable, how unbearable that is for the heart and, and the heart being moved out of compassion to show up, <laughs> we show up. Um, Yeah, and just this powerful moment here in, in the Twin Cities of racial reckoning. Um, uh, maybe you saw it about a month and a half ago, David Chappelle, he's an African-American um, comedian who I think is just masterful. He uh, was on Saturday Night Live. He go, gave an opening monologue, which I would recommend to anyone. And this is to me like a gift monologue, something that came deep from his heart and, and a, an invitation for all of us to, to be generous. And, and I, I cannot capture David Chappelle and I won't try to, but, but please, uh, please look this up. But I just, his last words were really powerful for me. And he was addressing the white people in, in the audience, he said, white people, <laughs> if you actually want to help, join me. Not even joking. It's my plan. It's called the kindness conspiracy. It's random acts of kindness for black people. Do something nice for a black person just because they're black. And you got to make sure they don't deserve it. They can't deserve it the same way all those years they did terrible things to black people just because they're black and they didn't deserve it. I'm thinking I'm adding this kindness conspiracy to my daily frame of intentions. <clears throat> uh, the Buddha said that it's a cause for merit to throw away the water after washing one's plate with a generous thought. May the particles of food in the washing water be food to the creatures on the ground. Maybe I'll end with this poem by Mary Oliver <clears throat> and it's called In Praise of Craziness of a Certain Kind. <clears throat> On cold evenings, my grandmother, 
with ownership of half her mind, the other half having flown back to Bohemia, spread newspapers over the porch floor. So, she said, the garden ants could crawl beneath as under a blanket and keep warm. <clears throat> And what shall I wish for, for myself, but being so struck by the lightning of years to be like her with what is left, that loving. So I, I thought um, one of the things that the Buddha recommended that we do is to pay attention to how we feel when the idea of giving a gift comes up in the mind how we feel when we offer a gift and how it feels when we reflect on having offered the gift. And I thought we could just do a one or two minute memory meditation um, just, just, to, just to practice what, what the Buddha uh, suggested. So you can just close your eyes and just remember a time you know, that you did a generous action and it could be something simple, just like holding a door for someone or something that happened today or something big. And if you can, can remember the origin of having the idea of doing the action of feeling the impulse of being generous in the heart and just taking note of how that felt. And then recalling the feeling of doing the action. And now in this moment, remembering the action. So when you recall having done the action, how that feels. So I think it's, it's a useful teaching to pay attention in these three ways. You know, it's like watering the, watering the seed by recalling how it feels when we're generous, you know. Okay. We're out of time. And so um, now's the time if you would uh, like to meet with in small groups just for a short time to discuss everything um, that interests you. Uh, Nancy will will do that. So, thank you so much, everyone, for for being here today. It's so great to sit with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>